everybody. Um, my name is Mandana Seyfedinipur. I'm the director of the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. For all of you, I see a lot of new faces that I don't know yet, but hopefully I will get to meet you over time. Um, and it's my uh, pleasure to host this uh, seminar today and to uh, introduce you to uh, Roland Lander. Roland is a linguist who uh, has come to work with us for two months. Um, from Griffith University in Australia. And he has worked on grammatical gender and the influence of grammatical gender on cognition, a clouding effect. And I will put out a disclaimer right now <laughs> that um, uh, it is my fault that the talk has 10 less slides on statistics. <laughs> and he really, really is very unhappy about that. So anything when you see it hurts him because he can't talk more about the formula, it's my fault. So. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're very happy to have him here. He is sitting in room 346, where also we are located, the Endangered Languages Archive, as well as the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, right next to the Multilingual Lab, which is the student room where we hope to see you a lot, because the room is for you guys. And um, if you want to talk to Roland and learn more about his work, please come and uh, visit us in room three, four, six. That's where he's placed until mid and November, hopefully. Um, he is here to explore possibilities on uh, collaboration with um, our linguists, like for example, the Crossroads Project or the Bantu Project, because those languages have, from a European gender system, really crazy categories. And when you learn about what he has done, you will understand why he's so excited about the work we are doing here and the understanding we have about languages that are usually not subject to this type of um, study. So I'm gonna hand over to Roland. Thank you very much, Mandana, for that um, introduction and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, continuing on on your disclaimer, I actually <laughs> kept, <laughs> those slides are here, so if you have any questions <laughs> at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we can get. We can. <laughs> we can talk about them um, after the presentation. They're in an appendix. Um, so I'm going to talk about, as Mandana said, about um, the influence of grammatical gender on cognition, uh, especially on conceptualization of objects. Um, I'll give you a bit of a background. I'll keep that fairly short. Talk about some of the previous studies that dealt with this issue. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about conceptualization, what it is, what are some of the issues that we need to think about when we, um, when we study conceptualization. Uh, and then I'll focus mainly on um, my study uh, that I carried out, all, um, about the AIM participants, the languages that I covered, um, which to some of you may be a bit boring, because uh, this is all <laughs> kept within um, kind of the European realm. Um, the design, it was a three-phase um, experiment, so it's uh, fairly complex, but I'll make it simple. And um, I'll talk a little bit <laughs> about the formal analysis. Uh, and um, the main part will be about the findings of, um, of um, what I actually found and um, some of the implications. So first of all, language and cognition. I mean, is there a, co uh, a connection between language and cognition? I mean, this is a question that's been pondered for literally millennia. And it was brought into um, to sharper focus recently by um, Sapir and Wolf, the Sapir-Wolf hypothesis. Many of you may have heard about that. Um, and uh, in fact, if there is a connection between language and cognition, if it, and if language influences cognition, uh, the next question is to what extent and how exactly um, does language influence cognition? So, um, but what I looked at specifically was grammatical gender and cognition um, because it's um, a lot more specific and a lot sexier. Um, many studies have put out the proposition that there is a, um, a relationship between um, grammatical gender and conceptualization. Namely, it's a, a, a positive correlation that if something, if a language assigns, say, masculine to an object, the speakers of that language will conceptualize that object as more masculine than feminine. Uh, and vice versa, if it um, assigns feminine, they will conceptualize uh, that object as more feminine. Now, some of the languages, as you know, like Spanish and German, um, assign a grammatical gender to each noun. So, for example, um, in Spanish, this would be a desk. El escritorio. It's masculine. 
that's a table, and that's la mesa, it's feminine. So according to these, um, this hypothesis, Spanish speakers would conceptualize the desk slightly more masculine than the table because of the grammatical gender that is assigned to it um, by Spanish. Now, this is not so clear cut. So there, are, there is a lot of disagreement in the field about whether this is the case. And there are a number of studies, I only mention a few, that argue against such a link. And there are also some studies that basically, as I put it, they sit on the fence. Um, I kept the whole, when language affects cognition and when it does not. I mean, that's the title of the article. This is actually one of the best articles that you can read on the topic, except that I have to warn you that the, um, the conclusion, um, after the description of a, of a series of really great experiments, uh, the conclusion is the biggest fizzer. Because it says sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, the end. Um, so it <laughs> but it's worth reading, um, just as long as you don't expect too much from the conclusion or um, any answers. So um, one study that I would like to um, have a look at in a, in a little bit more detail, simply because um, my methodology um, was inspired by this study is um, Borodinsky, Schmidt and Phillips from 2003. They carried out a um, study. They claimed that people's ideas um, about objects can be influenced by aspects of grammar. They went a little bit further. They actually were talking about even um, ideas, design, um, architecture as well, that it's all basically um, influenced by grammatical gender. They tested um, German and Spanish speakers. They tested them in English. I have issues with that as well. Um, so these were um, um, yeah, German and Spanish speaking participants, but they were all proficient speakers of English. They were all tested in the United States in English. I know. Um, they were asked to generate adjectives to describe objects, um, which I'll tell you why I thought that was actually quite clever. But first I'll so give you... What about German and Spanish? Sorry. Yes, oh. in English. I mean, it is, I, look, I agree that it is more expedient, and that's where my agreement kind of ends with, with testing, you know, when you're looking for an effect in someone's native language and you test them in another language. I know, I had the same look on my face, yeah. honestly. <laughs> um, but anyway, this was a, a fairly influential study, and it's cited a lot um, for some reason. Uh, they were asked to, so participants were asked to generate adjectives about objects. And I'll give you one example. And this example was bridge. Um, bridge is um, grammatically masculine in Spanish, el puente, and it's grammatically feminine in German, die Brücke. So um, these participants were asked to describe a bridge with adjectives, the first adjectives that came to mind. And um, behold, Spanish speakers describe bridges as big, dangerous, long, strong, sturdy, towering. What do you think? <laughs> Sorry? See, that's, a, that's another very good que question. We don't know how the stimuli were um, actually administered. No idea. I'd love to know. I've, but I the actually. Word stimuli. Okay. Or not? I hope so. <laughs> this was, this was, uh, yeah. The, the study was never published in a... It was published in a, it was book. published in a book. Yeah, and then it just Which went... Which meant it probably didn't go through peer review. Mm. Yeah. Nevertheless, it took off like wildfire um, from that book chapter. And it's, it's one of those studies that just pops up everywhere, mm -hmm. including Stephen Fry. It's sexy. Yeah. It is very sexy. It really is. It's a good story. It's an excellent mm -hmm. story. I couldn't agree more. It really is a great story. But, so what do you think Germans... Describe beautiful, elegant, fragile, peaceful, pretty, and slender. <laughs> yes, I mean, wow. I mean, this is really amazing, isn't it? Um, so, obviously, um, Borodicki and, and, and her team they concluded that there is a positive correlation between the grammatical gender of language assigned to an object and its gender-related conceptualization. So meaning that, um, you know, as you could just see, Spanish speakers, because it's grammatically masculine, will conceptualize it as more masculine and vice versa. Um, but, I, I do have some buts. Um, many other studies 
uh, especially some recent studies are suggesting that the, the interrelationship between grammatical features and conceptualization is a lot more subtle and it's a lot more complex than a positive correlation as described by Boroditsky and, um, and her team. Um, and that the effects triggered by language specific tasks may not necessarily mean, um, may not point to a direct influence on um, conceptualization. So what is conceptualization? Just a few words about that. This is conceptualization, right? Um, yes, what is it? Melon. It's a melon, yeah? Watermelon. Describe a watermelon, yeah. Describe a watermelon. Round and green. Round and green. Stripey. 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 Juicy. Juicy. Sweet. Sweet. Heavy. Heavy. Colourful, yeah, anything else? Cool, cool. cool. yeah. It's a fruit. It's a fruit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> give me some adjectives, as in what is it like? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so we said, um, now what are from these, I mean, the, 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 you know, what can we actually see? Like what are the perceptible attributes of this watermelon, what can we see? I mean, we can see that it's round, we can see that it's green. If we actually had a watermelon here, we could touch it, we could probably feel that it's smooth. If we lift it, we could feel that it's heavy. Um, but we also said it's juicy, sweet. Um, we could argue that it's delicious. How do we know that? We don't know that until we actually cut a watermelon. Um, so how do we know that? We know that because we had previous interaction with a watermelon, right? <laughs> I mean, most of us would have tasted a watermelon. Um, so we know that when we cut it, it's going to be red, it's going to be juicy. When we taste it, it's going to be sweet, delicious, you know, all those things that we just mentioned. Um, the only point I'm trying to make here about conceptualization is that what characteristics we assign to an object goes way beyond what we can actually perceive about the object. It also comes down to previous experience with the object, etc. It also comes down to environmental factors, um, idiosyncratic factors, as in how do I feel about a watermelon? I might hate watermelon. So I might not say that it's sweet and, and, and juicy. I might say it's yucky and disgusting, <laughs> right? Um, cultural factors, etc., etc. So conceptualization is not as, as straightforward uh, as it may seem from a, a round watermelon. <coughs> now, the big question is whether linguistic features such as grammatical gender, play a part in how we conceptualize objects. And, this is, and, if, and if it does, how and to what degree? This is what I set out to have a look at, to have a closer look at. So about this study, a few words. The aim of the study was to investigate the, re the relationship between um, grammatical categories and, um, and cognition by looking at um, grammatical gender and conceptualization of objects. Uh, it was a fairly large-scale study, 1,290 participants um, um, took part in this study um, from 24 countries, of which I'm very proud, um, and they were all native speakers of the target language. And I should also mention that all um, the um, experiments were kept in the target language. So it was not none of that English business, <laughs> other than for the English speakers. But while we're talking about the languages, um, the languages are sitting on a, on a so-called gender loading scale. Now, this gender loading scale was originally pr proposed by Alexander Giora back in the 80s. Basically, it is a scale that is looking at um, languages uh, according to the degree to which they necessitate speakers to be mindful of gender. And I will explain that um, a little bit more. Um, we can probably argue about uh, you know, how they sit on here, but we can, we can do that in the Q&A. Basically, we start with a zero gender load language, such as Hungarian. Hungarian does not have any grammatical gender, and it does not even have um, gendered pronouns. So there is no he and she. Of course, there is a third person pronoun. Uh, it encodes that we're talking about a person, we're talking about a third person, but it does not include any information about the gender of that person, whether we're talking about a male or a female. And I should mention at this point, that um, Hungarian in this respect is not unique. There are a number of languages that do not have any grammatical gender whatsoever, and um, not even a gendered pronominal system. Um, all Finno-Greek languages, so 
Finnish, Hungarian, Estonian. All Turkic languages are non-gendered. Um, they don't have any gender at all. Now why I put, and this is um, why on this scale, English is sitting as a, a partial or low gender loading language. Because when we put it next to a language like Hungarian, there is some gender in English. While English does not assign a grammatical gender to each noun, it does have a gendered pronominal system. So there is he and she. So if I say that Mandana stood up, tripped, and hid himself, is that correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, did I, what did I get wrong? My gender. If I can get the gender wrong, that means it features, I have to be mindful when I speak English, I have to be mindful that who I'm talking about is a male or a female, right? I cannot make this mistake in Hungarian, for example, or in a, in a completely non-gendered language, you cannot make this mistake because there's no um, gendered pronominal system. So this is why. And now, Spanish, I put it at a full with two grammatical genders, masculine and feminine. Um, full just means that Spanish assigns a grammatical gender to each noun. So each noun, as I explained about the desk and the table, would have a grammatical gender. Hebrew uh, was another language that um, also has two grammatical genders, masculine and feminine, but it permeates the language to a much greater degree than it does in Spanish. Um, it features in the, in the um, verb conjugation, it features in first person pronouns, it features a lot more than it does in Spanish, for example. And then I put German um, on top, and as I said, we can argue about that, um, which also has a full grammatical gender system, um, but with three grammatical genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter as well. And it does assign there's you know, agreement, etc. Now let's have a look at the um, stimuli that were used. This is, and I'll explain in a, um, in a minute in a, uh, a bit more detail about what I uh, did exactly, but I would like to show you the stimuli first of all that were used because I, it was a fairly similar study to Boroditsky's that I asked my participants to describe objects. Except that to make sure that all the experiments were um, gauging the, the gender load uh, associated with these objects accurately, I included some control items that were clearly, um, you know, the natural gender was clear. There were um, four feminine items, bride, ballerina, girl, woman. Four masculine items, boy, sailor, man, boxer. These were mixed in with all the other. Now, this is where the trickery came because I was looking for um, objects that had opposite grammatical genders in some of these languages. So there were four objects that had opposite grammatical gender in German and Spanish. So like bridge, I already mentioned bridge before, and bridge, fork, table, star. Um, then there was a group of four that had opposite grammatical gender in German and Hebrew. Then there were four that had opposite grammatical gender in Spanish and Hebrew. And the last four was the same grammatical gender in all of them. Two feminine ones, two masculine ones. So what participants had to do they had to look at these objects. Um, they were presented in different conditions, uh, either text or image. Um, the ones that had the text condition did not know about the image ones. The ones that had the images did not know about the text ones. And they were asked to come up with the first three adjectives that came to mind to describe these objects. Um, and then the five most frequently occurring adjectives were collated. Um, and just to give you an example, this was the um, Stimulus fork, text condition, image condition. In English, these were the five most frequently occurring adjectives to describe a fork. Sharp, shiny, pointy, useful, metallic. As you can see, there's not a, a, a huge difference between text and image condition in this case. They're basically the same adjectives in a slightly different order. Um, shiny, sharp, useful, metallic, pointy. Um, just to show off, I'll show you the, the Hebrew ones as well that the five most frequently occurring adjectives were um, shiny, sharp, useful, small, pretty. Yeah. And uh, for the image condition, sharp, useful, shiny, serrated, effective. Um, well, it is, I suppose, effective. Um, so these were um, ju uh, just some examples of the five most frequently occurring adjectives. So in phase two, these adjectives were rated. 
And this was by a completely different cohort of participants who were not aware of the first phase. They were simply presented with lists of adjectives and they did not know where these adjectives came from. So these, uh, the adjectives collected in this first phase were used in the second phase as stimuli. Now this is where um, some trickery had to be employed. They were told a, a bit of a story about a cartoon that we are making and they were asked that an animated character in a cartoon described by a given adjective, should this character have a male voice or a female voice? Okay, so if a character is described as big, should it have a male voice or a female voice? It was a, a voice attribution task. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if a character is described as pretty, should it have a male voice or a female voice? And um, they were also given an opt-out. They were given a, a can decide option, which was in the instructions that was discouraged. So it said, you know, only if you really cannot make up your mind, put down can decide. So this is how these adjectives were rated. Um, this is a quick example of bridge from the image condition in English. These were the um, five most frequently occurring adjectives, long, strong, tall, big, sturdy. And you can see the, um, the gender ratings there as well that um, there was fairly clear consensus on bridge in English. So male voice, uh, for long, for example, 49 participants said it should have a male voice, like a, you know, someone described as long. Um, 19 said female voice and seven couldn't decide. Um, with sturdy, there was all 75 participants in this language in this phase agreed that some, like a character described as sturdy, should have a male voice in our um, cartoon. So overall, as you can see, this was rated as overwhelmingly more masculine um, when we relate these um, scores back to Bridge. Bridge was um, conceptualized as more masculine than feminine. So in phase three, this phase was the, the complicated one. This was the one where we had to figure out exactly what was going on with all these scores, where we had to relate these scores that we got from the adjective back to the original stimuli that generated them, okay? To establish the um, gender-related conceptualization and whether it has anything to do with the grammatical gender that is assigned to, to these um, objects in some of the languages. So um, gender load scores were established for each adjective. Then these gender load scores had to be related back to the original stimuli. And also the relative strength of the connection between these, so taking into account frequencies and weighting, etc., um, had to be established um, as well. A very quick word about the formal analysis, <laughs> and I'm not going to use any equations, I, I promise. But um, one thing, because it is important, one thing that I um, that occurred to me as I was looking through the literature is that uh, where a, a statistical analysis was even described or explained. They were mainly using uh, an analysis of variance or a repeated measures analysis of variance. This is a, a, a statistical um, um, tool that you use for um, a continuous response, um, which is why this, is, this was one of the problems. I mean, gender association response, responses of the type used here are essentially binary and discrete. So. Um, ANOVA is also uh, a bit inefficient in isolating confounders, of which we have many. Keep in mind that we need to um, try to um, disentangle all kinds of effects, from cultural effects to idiosyncratic, remember the, the melon, um, uh, and find what is actually due to the grammatical gender that is assigned to these objects. So we used a logistic regression and um, I promise to keep it short because it is actually uh, a bit like ANOVA except that it's developed for a binary response. Um, so it was a lot better suited for this kind of data. Um, it is specifically designed for this kind of um, analysis and it is a lot more effective in um, dealing with multiple confounders, as I said, of which we have many here. Um, so we could actually detect subtle effects a lot more effectively with this kind of analysis. Now, to give you one example of all the complexities that we had to deal with, one was we had to develop a, an adjective stimulus association measure. And why we had to do that is because adjectives, obviously, 
occurred for sometimes for multiple stimuli. Okay, and I'll explain, I'll illustrate that in a minute. But if an adjective was uniquely uh, associated with a stimulus, everything was clear, except that in most cases that was not um, the case. So in which case the implications were a bit ambiguous. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. For example, here are from, from the Spanish cohort, there are two um, adjectives, hondo or onda, means deep in Spanish, grande means big. Um, Ondo was easy. It was associated with one stimulus, only with plate. Okay? Plate generated um, deep in Spanish, and no other um, stimulus uh, generated this same adjective. So that was clear. These are the um, uh, male voice, female voice, can't decide. So that was easy to relate back to plate. However, grande was associated with 11 of the stimuli from different conditions. So obviously there were frequency issues, weighting issues that had to be taken into account here. Um, and as you can see, it ranges from um, a frequency of 8 to 34. So this would mean that these adjectives were relating back to the stimuli quite differently. So the implications, this is what I meant that the implications were somewhat ambiguous. This had to be built into the model about which I'm not allowed to talk. Um, <laughs> Um, but anyway, so this is just to give you an idea of you know, some of the complexities that we had to deal with and why an ANOVA, a stock standard um, ANOVA analysis is, was, was just not going to cut it simply. So we had to come up with um, a, a finer grain. Um, let's have a look at the findings. Um, as I said, they were control and test stimuli. The control stimuli were simply there to test the, uh, the instrument to test the experiments that they could um, gauge uh, gender-related conceptualization. A quick word about the scores, they were represented on a continuous scale. Uh, anything positive means masculine, anything negative means feminine, okay? Sorry? Uh, don't read too much into that. It's, uh, like, it had to be one or the other. <laughs> um, so let's have a quick look at the, the control stimuli and um, Let's see if the, the instrument worked. I mean, I'm standing here talking about it, so obviously it did. Uh, sorry, spoiler. Um, <laughs> um, here are the scores for ballerina. As you can see, consistently in all the languages, all the conditions, even though with these adjectives, decontextualized, given to a whole different cohort, then these scores related back to the original stimulus, it still came up consistently in all the conditions, all the languages as feminine. Boxer came up as masculine which was great news. Um, but actually, just to give you a further idea, all of them in all the languages, in all the conditions. So we were um, fairly confident that um, this way of trying to gauge um, gender-related um, conceptualization worked because all the, um, the female controls were rated as feminine and all the, the, the male controls were um, rated as masculine. But the real juicy part is really going to be the, the test stimuli. Um, and here's bridge. Now, to explain my buttons, which are a lot of fun, um, we're having a feminine side here, a masculine side here. Um, these buttons are sitting where um, grammatical gender would suggest that they should be sitting. Okay, keep in mind the, the Borodicka hypothesis. Um, Hungarian and English, sorry, different flags, sorry. Um, um, <laughs> Hungarian and English, they don't assign a grammatical gender, they're in the middle. Um, Spanish and Hebrew, um, masculine. So they're sitting on the masculine side. Um, German, feminine. So we would expect, if Borodisky is right, this should stay somewhere here, those two should stay somewhere over there, and we have no idea what these will do. Um, however, this is what it ended up looking like um, at the end. So they were, as you can see, they were actually pulling towards the masculine in all languages. Probably the, the one that was least... <laughs> is the one that really shouldn't have been. Um, because uh, in, in the image condition in Hebrew, that, that was the one that was close to zero, so it was a, a little bit um, unclear. But um, all of them were rated as masculine. It's also interesting to notice that um, the Hungarian and the English speakers were pretty sure about what they were doing, um, which was, I'll get back to that, because this gets juicier. Um, chair. What, I, should, I should take bits. Yes. I, I need to make some money here, you know. Um, 
What do you think? What do you think happened with Jay? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but once again, it's remarkable how regardless of grammatical gender, they were pulling on the one side. In this case, on the masculine side, regardless of what grammatical gender. And again, English and Hungarian speakers are just great. They're really good at this, which was a bit of a, bit of a surprise at first. Um, ring. Like that. That's it. I tried not to, you know, they were all black and white, very, very standard pictures. Masculine or feminine? <laughs> <laughs> it's feminine. <laughs> In all the languages. Um, table. <laughs> Masculine. <laughs> so, but... Basically, the point I'm making here is that grammatical gender did not seem to be a predictor at all. It did not appear to play a part in this at all, um, regardless of the grammatical gender that is assigned to this. And I have the rest of them here. There's bridge. Um, now, there were obviously a few outliers. For example, with fork, um, the only condition in which it was uh, rated a bit more feminine than masculine was in Hebrew, where it's grammatically um, masculine. So it was kind of going against grammatical gender. Um, um, table, we already saw that. Star, again, it was a bit all over the place, but look at German. It's der Stern. It's masculine in German. It was rated the most feminine in German. Um, again, the point I'm trying to make here is that it did not, like we did not see any um, evidence that grammatical gender was predicting the, the gendered conceptualization here. Cloud, same story. A few outliers, absolutely, apparently nothing to do with grammatical gender. Pistol was a pretty clear case, um, that it was all rated masculine. It was, um, it was one of those really good cases, actually, just, sorry, quick story, about the... Um, <laughs> Pistol was, I mean, the, the adjectives are very consistent throughout the throughout four of the languages. Uh, dangerous, deadly, you know, loud, all that. A except in Hebrew, where the top two most frequently occurring adjectives were loaded and useful, um, which was... <laughs> which I thought was cool. Um, ring. Same kind of thing. A moon, once again, you see... Um, it's feminine in Hebrew. It was rated not very strongly, but somewhat masculine. So once again, it's feminine in Spanish, and it was rated masculine. Um, so you're kind of getting my point, I, I hope, that um, we did not find any, any evidence for um, grammatical gender predicting the gendered conceptualization of these objects. Hand fish. Now, so as I said, as you could expect, even after very careful analysis, there was no evidence that there was a positive correlation between grammatical gender and the gendered conceptualization of an object. In fact, the effect turned out to be slightly paradoxical. I'm talking about a tiny effect here, so um, don't read too much into it. But it's not that, that it didn't reach um, statistical significance. It was actually slightly paradoxical, meaning that um, grammatically feminine objects were slightly more likely to be rated as masculine. As you can see, this number is positive here. And grammatically masculine objects were slightly more likely to be rated as feminine. So I was fairly convinced that this positive correlation effect was... It, we didn't have any um, evidence for it. However, I have lots of buts and howevers. Um, when we were looking at the data, um, something interesting was, was emerging from the data, which was, as you could see, remember me praising um, English and um, Hungarian speakers, how well they did with these tasks? Well, that's exactly what occurred to us, that it looked a little bit odd. So we decided to look into, as an additional, and it, this was uh, really an exploratory measure at the time, to look into the absolute magnitude of the scores. And the magnitude here just means that how far away from zero they are. 
because um, we thought that it would be informative of the, um, the confidence of the consensus. Okay? The further away a score is from zero, the clearer the, cons the consensus would appear to be. Right? And if it's really just hovering around zero, then it indicates that the consensus is really not all that clear. Okay, so that's why we thought since there's some information in these magnitudes, let's have a look at them, whether there's any pattern. Uh, because it prompted a speculation that there may, when we looked at the magnitudes, um, there was a pattern, in fact, and it was suggesting that uh, the complexity of, um, of gender systems may actually, to some degree, suppress the confidence with which participants assign gendered characteristics to objects, which was interesting, to say the least. So we thought, well, let's test it another way, because this is really, um, this is really cool. So we looked at the can decide responses. And remember I mentioned that um, um, participants were given an, a, a can decide option that was discouraged. Um, I'll make a very quick point here <laughs> about how um, participants were great in all languages because only 6% of them um, uh, gave a can decide response overall. Except that, um, and for statistics we need numbers, big numbers. Uh, because we had so many participants and so many responses, this was actually possible. Because even that 6% translated to 4,163 can decide responses overall. So we could actually have a look, we could do a proper analysis on whether there's any pattern of these can decide responses across the languages. And guess what? It was actually suggestive of the same thing as the magnitude test. Um, it suggested pretty much the same thing, that the um, indecision increases with the complexity of a gender system, which was fascinating. To show you, these are the most beautiful five dots that I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Um, they are gorgeous. You have, come on, you have to give that to me. <laughs> that's what's, that's just anyway. Um, so here, as you can see, we're going to decisive towards indecisive, and this is taking into account the, the magnitudes and the can decide responses, and this is the, the gorgeous, pattern that emerges from that. And we start with Hungarian that has zero gender, then closely followed by English, which has a, a, like some gender loading, and then we have a big gap. And then we go with the fully gendered languages, Spanish, Hebrew, and um, German, most in the indecisive Germans, sorry. Um, so this was really suggesting that there was something going on. So while we did not find any evidence for a positive correlation effect, this is, really su this is basically suggestive of some other effect that maybe, maybe the complexity of a, of a grammatical gender system does have an influence on the, um, on the um, decisiveness, decisiveness with which um, gendered characteristics are assigned. Now, a few notes at the end. And this was an effect that jumped out um, at, at us. Um, so it was an unexpected finding, which means that these experiments were not designed with this in mind. Okay, so keep this in mind. Um, obviously, I would say that more studies and targeted research, I mean, this is offering up a hypothesis that maybe we should be looking at grammatical gender in a, in a different way, and we should be careful with what we're actually looking for or what kind of effect it is that we're looking for. And that's why I would say that the approach and preconceptions, that if we're looking for an effect, it is going to be a positive correlation, that preconception should probably be revisited and re-examined. And that's all I've got today. Do you have any questions? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, have you looked at the languages in terms of the functional load of natural gender within the gender system. So my hunch would be that that's bigger in Spanish than in German, where female mm -hmm. nouns can have grammatical female gender, yeah. also grammatically masculine gender. Mm -hmm. Whereas my hunch would be that in Spanish, the proportion of naturally female nouns that have grammatically female gender would be higher. 
And would that influence your results? That would be very interesting to look into, but no, we, we didn't look into that particular thing. But that would be, yeah, I agree, it would be very interesting to see um, whether that is the case. Yeah, we didn't okay. check it. Yes. yes. Uh, I know it's not a massive list of lexical items, so uh, if, you, if you can't answer this, I understand. But it, so it appears that grammatical gender is not influencing people's attribution of adjectives. Well, what I'm saying, it's not, it's not a positive correlation. I'm actually, like, these results suggest that they do influence to some degree, but it's not, not in a way that was proposed before. So it's not a positive correlation. It doesn't mean that if something is grammatically masculine, it will be conceptualized as more masculine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So do you yeah. feel like this is some kind of neuro... Because there, there were trends clearly across all the languages as to whether they preferred yeah. masculine or feminine adjectives. Yeah. So do you feel like this is a kind of cultural zone? It could, it could easily be because, I mean, admittedly, all these languages, I mean, one thing that I did which, which wasn't done much before is actually breaking out of the Indo-European mold because if you look at these studies, if you look at psycholinguistic studies about grammatical gender, I mean, it gets as exotic as Italian. <laughs> um, or, you know, language du jour um, lately is Slavic languages. But it's, it's basically all Indo-European, same cultural sphere, etc. I did try to break out of that but because Hungarian is not Indo-European and Hebrew is not Indo-European. So it was, you know, I was interested to see. But in terms of culture, I would say that they would, you know, I would put them in the same cultural sphere. So we don't, you know, it's not, it would be very interesting. I mean, why do you think I'm here? You know, <laughs> being, being nice to people. <laughs> because it would be fascinating to have a look at that as in outside of this, this cultural sphere. And um, with languages that, that have some really, really groovy uh, noun classification systems. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, an off the cuff prediction for kind of noun class systems, uh, like you have in Africa, would be oh my God, people are so completely focused on all the other semantic aspects encoded in the noun class system that they are the least best at focusing on natural gender, actually. Yeah. Because, you know, they have all these noun classes that encode other semantic aspects. And it's normally only one paragraph or gender that has animus. Or yeah. Something unique. So I'd love to. Really, you know, marginal category. Yeah. In these large systems. So yeah. that would be nice. Kind of, because that I think it would be fantastic yeah. if you, you know, have you, you could have a study with uh, non class languages, like reduced systems like Wolof or some bit of Congo language with five, six, seven mm. non classes, and then, you know, to the other extreme, like Atlantic, but two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's why, I mean, I flew 27 hours to be here. So um, <laughs> it's, yeah, that's why, because I think it would be absolutely fascinating to, to apply, you know, some, um, um, what I would call sophisticated um, quantitative um, analyses to, to some of these languages and see whether we can find some patterns and, and what is actually going on. I'm, I'm sorry, I think there was a question. I'll get back uh, to you. This kind of relates to what Lauren was saying with the cultural zone. Like you have you know, objects like ring that are very associated with feminine yeah. qualities, and you could possibly argue that things that are supportive, like a table, a fridge, a chair, yeah. that you know, kind of more masculine, like yeah. in your, not you as a no, because it, it has a I mean it has a lot to do with metaphorical features as well yeah, as in you know yeah. like the shape of it, the the size of it, the you know associations as in used by someone like used by women more than like these associations. Yeah. So I'm wondering, has anybody ever looked at grammatical gender with a kind of log type test? Like, have they made up objects and words with assigned gender to them and then tested that? Or? Yes, they actually. It was more about they did some studies with made up genders <laughs> and um, like I don't know if you heard about the usative and supertive categories um, same it's, it was another uh, uh, Boroditsky study and it was actually quite interesting because they came up with uh, totally arbitrary as in just they made up two gender classes uh, and they put in objects um, like a violin I think it was that they um, grouped with either uh, like with some um, natural gender um, you know, uh, controls like a man or a giant or king or something. And when they were grouped with, um, with males, the claim was that um, it was described as um, 
What was it? I, I think my favorite was overused, and uh, which is apparently a, a masculine quality. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's not think about that too hard. Um, and um, um, basically, this this same kind of thing that the adjectives really differed, um, like based on what what they what they were, whether they were grouped with men or with women. But um, yeah, with made up objects, as in that would be. But that would be very difficult to actually like, gauge whether language has anything to do with that yeah. um, if, if you're working with made-up objects. And I would say that you could probably do something, and I would say that you know, anything that was kind of roundish and small <laughs> would be conceptualized as more feminine and whereas angular and you know, would be more, more masculine, I'd say. But no, I'm, I'm not aware of, of such a study. Yeah. Yes. When you mentioned the Hebrew conception of Kistel. Yeah. Um, Once again, don't read too much into it. No, no, <laughs> but um, it could be interesting to compare Israeli Arab with, and I don't necessarily mean Palestinian because there are also yeah. speakers of Arab that do not speak a yeah. Palestinian dialect but are integrated in the urban society of yeah. Israel and so culturally somehow connected to Europe yeah. compared to speakers of Arab in regions that yeah, which would be, which yeah, I agree would be would be interesting. I mean, there were some which I would call cultural effects. I mean, the other the other interesting thing was that for star, for example, Hungarian speakers, one of the most frequently occurring adjectives was communist. <laughs> um, so you know, obviously that is like there's it's specific to certain events, like to like a certain group, a certain country. So yeah, I mean these these <coughs> these things occur. Sorry. It's masculine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, for a couple of the examples you showed us, and I'm sorry I've forgotten which ones now, but there were a couple of the outliers examples. Yes. And there was quite a difference between the score you got with the text stimulus yes. and with the yes. image yes. stimulus. Yes. Did you have a chance to investigate that further? Or is the score I did actually, and that was one of the reasons why I had the two conditions in the first place, to see whether there's any difference between... There, there, there were some, some claims, and they're not very well tested to date, whether um, um, you see you know, a, a text <laughs> or if you see an image, that same question, whether the language that you speak, you know, it may affect the way you think for speaking, <laughs> but it may not affect your conceptualization as such as how you see the world around you, so to speak. But um, what I found here in this study, there, there were no consistent differences. Um, so whatever, like there were some, as you point out, there were some where, where the difference was, was quite great between the two conditions, but there didn't, there didn't seem to be any pattern to that. So they were really just outliers. That sometimes it, it happens that it's conceptualized one way in one condition and the other in another. And overall, when you look at the overall results, it was actually remarkably consistent. Um, to be to be perfectly candid, I did not even expect anything like anywhere near this consistent. Um, but um, and also it was a limitation of the study that it's really um, you know for to test that. Um, I would have to give participants a, a purely non-linguistic task to test that. But because they had to generate adjectives here, that's a linguistic task. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, you know, that was a, probably a bit of a clumsy attempt to have a look at that, but we didn't find anything, so it serves us right. Um, but, yeah, to answer your questions, we didn't find any, any pattern there. But um, there are some studies that, that look into that. I can think of a Ramos and Robertson study from 2010. I'm happy to give the, <laughs> the, uh, the um, uh, reference that was looking at like, how the um, stimuli are administered, whether that has any effect on the results. And they found that it, it appears to have some effect, yes. But it does need further studies. Yes. How did I manage to meet? How did you get so many participants? This was an online study. Oh, okay. This was online because that was, that's what I had to train in. See, the pilots were in person, and it made them, and it made it very clear that if I won the numbers, it's just not going to work. It's going to take the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, no, these were um, the um, 
I mean, there's a bit of a trade-in with the, with the online. I mean, what I didn't mention is that um, almost 200 participants' responses were not taken into account because they didn't, like, they, there was either something dodgy or they, they gave um, um, a native language, especially in Hebrew, that was an issue that I actually had quite like a, a good number of respondents, Hebrew speakers, except that they were not native speakers. And it's actually quite common um, that they're proficient Hebrew speakers, but that's not their native language. Um, but yeah, that's how. And uh, it was uh, utilized like all kinds of networks. And I got um, ethical clearance to even use social media and everything. So it was not easy in Australia, ethical clearance, not easy. So I was very happy about that. <laughs> yes. Did you sum up control for which other languages people spoke? Because you could ask me about English. Yes. You would have to <laughs> that I also speak German and French. Yes. And that, that might mess up my English. Language. Yes. To some degree, we did. We, um, you see, ideally, I would love to have made it um, a, a condition that they have to be monolingual or a control for the language. But these numbers, it was simply not, not, not feasible um, to control for it. Uh, what we know is that most, like the vast majority of the participants, spoke other languages. I think there's a correlation between being part of an online study and being multilingual. Right? Yeah. 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 Plus, it was. Um, I mean, when we talk about, you know, when we're um, talking about like a, a German or Hungarian participants, I mean, in like in Hungary, it's compulsory to, you know, by the time you finish primary school, you have to speak two languages. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it would be a bit of a mission to find. Uh, monolinguals. I mean, they, they don't have to yeah. be monolingual, but you would have to know what they speak. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that you yeah. can factor out um, yeah. the control for, for their own yeah. languages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in this study, we only control for whether they do or, or don't, and yeah, the majority of them did speak some other language. Yes. But, to, sorry, can I just say one more thing? That is, w like, one of the reasons um, that their native language had to be the target language. That was a condition, so we did control for that. Um, and I really was looking for, you know, whether... Um, like effects in their native language. So that's what I mentioned at the beginning, that a lot of the studies actually used in like, you know, another language to test that, which I found a bit strange. But next time. <coughs> yes. Um, back to the, about the rule test, like which gender would be assigned to the mm -hmm. uh, figures or whatever. Um, so do you happen to know anything about uh, new words in languages and which gender is to them, and if there's any patterns or... It's um, very interesting because talking about new words, I mean, my favorite, um, this is just my observation. The German appears to assign neuter to most of the, the new words or, or borrowed words. May not be the case. Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I don't know. It's their confusion. Yeah, this is, I don't have the data to back this up. <laughs> but um, interestingly, for ex uh, like Spanish is probably my, my favorite, where um, the two varieties, you know how there's Iberian Spanish, the, sp the Spanish spoken in Spain, and then there's um, um, Latin American Spanish. Um, computer in Spain is el ordenador, el, masculine. In Latin America, same language, la computadora. Uh, it's the same thing. Same language, um, but it's actually assigned to two. <laughs> yeah, but still, I mean, it's it's quite. I mean, talking about new new words. I mean. Yes, I think it would be interesting about you know loan words. Yeah. I mean, in Chinese branch was Swahili, for example. They tend to be channels who are speaking now Swahili. Yeah. And I wonder if I think just to follow up from Annie's question, that would be interesting. How do you see? Very. I agree. It would be very interesting Can to see. Add that in French, the long words in my dialect and in Parisian French, do, they do not have the same gender. They do not have the same gender. Yeah. yeah. It would be certainly a very interesting study to have a look at. Yeah, I think the same in Norwegian. In my dialect, it's, we have a lot of feminine words. But in the, what they speak in also, the more normalized Norwegian, it's mm -hmm. basically Bok -bok and, masculine yeah. and neutral. The feminine is out. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. There are actually, there, there's a new study that's just come out this year about um, Norwegian, the two versions, the Bukmarland, mm -hmm. yeah. Nynorsk, yeah. Um, 
uh, comparing the grammatical gender of that, uh, like the, the two, how apparently they're, they're quite different. Because they were trying to see, you know, like without cultural differences, whether just the language produces differences. And their findings are actually very similar to mine. Yeah, yeah that there's, there's, there's no, but certainly no positive correlation. Um, so it's interesting. Yes. Um, so did you look at what countries the native speakers are from, like especially yes. English and Spanish, since it's so yes. both of them yes. so widespread? Did yeah. you yes, look yes, at yes. that as a factor? Or? Well, I didn't really look at that as a factor. That it was it was checked, as in that was controlled okay. for that they had to be from a from a country where the the language is a you know a first language and it's the native language and it's the main language spoken. Um, they were, um, I mean, obviously they were trans for English. You know, the majority of the participants came from Australia. Um, for um, Spanish, the majority of them came from Spain, and then, you know, with Argentina and um, in Mexico, close second. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got all the you know I've got the numbers. Um, no, we didn't look at uh, any correlation whether there's whether that made a difference, because with the other languages, I mean, with you know, Hungarian, mm-hmm. you know, poor little Hungarians, they kind of live in the one country, um, and with Germans as well, I think we had all up, all up two Austrians. Everyone was from Germany, so um, yeah. We, as I said, we have the data. It's something that we can we can bake a little bit later and have a look whether there's any correlation there. Yes. Um, it's quiz uh, rather than showing people an object and asking them to assign a test as uh, a sign a gender. Yeah. It's like a rock test. Is it possible to invent words and ask people to assign a gender without giving them any meaning? Yeah. So there's a correlation between the sounds of the words or Yes, which would be interesting. I well, and not necessarily to deal with gender, but you, you heard of the Kiki and Booba yeah. kind of thing that you know how how you know something sounds. Um, have you have you not? It's about how, like, if you, um, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a thingy, um, but does anyone have a marker? Um, I don't. Sorry. Sorry, but this is, has to do with. Um, don't worry, I'll just. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, there was. Um, I mean, this this goes back to the twenties. I mean, this was when uh, a psychologist came up with this, and then there, there are many, many studies on this. That you know, when you ask participants, sorry, which one is Kiki and which one is Booba? <laughs> which one do you think is Kiki? <laughs> Kiki, Booba. The agreement on that appears is like almost you know universal. That this is like this one is Kiki here. And this one is Booba. So there appear to be <laughs> some correlation between the, the form of the word or the sound of the word and um, you know, associations that we make with them. So to. Um, other sense associations, though. Yeah. Not. Yeah. With, with gender, yeah. With gender, I'm not aware of a, a study that's, that's looked into that. In fact, what I'm trying to, and um, you know, a, a, a tiny bit of criticism of, of my field, which I probably shouldn't do. Um, <laughs> Is that, as I said, that really, when I said that it gets as exotic as Italian, I wasn't really exaggerating or joking even. Um, they're kind of getting a little bit samey um, and looking at the same thing over and over and over again. But uh, t- to be fair, there's really still no consensus on what's going on. That's why what I was trying to do is, first of all, compare more than two languages. That's why I went for five. To, so Because it's a bit more reliable to kind of draw any kind of conclusion when you compare more. I try to go for more participants and that sort of thing to get a, a clearer picture of what may be going on so we can move on to interesting stuff like that, for example, and to you know, Atlantic, <coughs> Bantu languages and, and all that and have a look at noun classes and, and the correlations that they may offer up. Yes? Yeah, I mean, moving to those languages, I mean, most speakers of these languages are at least bilingual. You know, for instance, for many Bantu languages spoken in um, Anglophone, East Africa, English, and one or several Bantu and other languages. And uh, you know, for the Atlantic languages, many of them are spoken in areas um, where Romance languages are mm-hmm. the official languages or Portuguese-based Creole. So you al- always would have multilingualism that involves different gender types. Yes. Yes. Um, 
So I'm just trying to, to imagine, you know, what would be an interesting hypothesis for such a study. Um, so would, um, would you expect all the languages to influence well, that would be very interesting to see. For that, we or would have. Would you, would you imagine different language conditions? So, you know, depending on which language. Uh, well, it would be depending on the usage patterns of these languages, for example, as in, uh, like in what situations they use to, to, like, how much they are used, like, how, how much they, like, I don't know, do they code switch between one and the other all the time? Or, or are there certain situations, like, I go to the market and use X, and then I go home and use Y, and then I go to school and then use Z? Uh, I mean, are there such a. These would all have to be taken into account, but obviously that would that would need an even finer grained uh, analysis than this one. But um, everything's possible. The th I mean, I think that what so one of the things is that that can that is part of the statistical measure, right? Mm. To see how the weighting of so one of the issues of use, right, has something to do with frequency, right? So if you use something a lot, if you have if you speak a number of languages that have gender systems, and you use that a lot, then there should be more influence because that's your habitual way mm -hmm. of, oh. while if you have something where you don't have that, so it would be important in the design of the study to look at the balance of the two and find comparisons, right? And then in the study itself, when you can assess, for example, frequency of usage to certain things, then you can throw this in as a factor in the, in the statistical analysis, and that would be, would have to be done in these yeah. But that's, I mean, that, that can be controlled. It, I yeah. mean, it can yeah. be, it yeah. has to be controlled for it. That's the most important thing. Well, I mean, in a similar study, we, you know, Chelsea's, we ruled out that we can control for language frequency. Mm. So, you know, we have that now as a continuous variable because we cannot control for that, to, you know. But it's a continuous variable. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, what that I mean. Mm. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. You have a continuous yeah. variable, so you control for it. You mm -hmm. account for yes. it yeah. account in the analysis. Yes. Absolutely. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. the most important thing, so you need to assess that. Yes, Jay. I think in addition to the semantic or spatial linguistics, and, uh, and I think this is important, the, the sound of the you know, mm -hmm. shift of words, but also the, the morphology of the words also, I think, of the language of place, because uh, generally Spanish words, you know, if they end with A, they tend to be phonetic. If they end with O or A, they tend to be masculine. And in Bantu, Yeah. But not, 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 not natural. Yeah. yeah. That's the same problem. You have a pattern, and the pattern goes yeah. against exactly yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. German does have has that too. That it's morphologically there is a pattern yeah. with this with the semantic thing. Yes. <coughs> it goes back to the conversation earlier. I think I think what would be interesting on on the African languages, Bantu languages, it's it's hard to continue with this study because you know that's. But the other thing, of course, which is interesting, is to look at the what seems like the semantic parameters encoded in these number systems. Yes. Mm. So this, you know, here your semantics is very clear. You have, you have you know, gender, whatever, whatever yeah. that is, but it's independent of language. Mm. You know. But then you could go to the noun class systems and say, okay, what's what's in there? Gender precisely is not in there, so that would make it interesting. But it's also interesting to then, then see, well, animacy clearly yes. is a yeah. very important feature. Mm -hmm. Size or shape mm -hmm. often plays a role. Yeah. Then there is you know, attitudes, derogatory, like you know, ugly or not so nice mm -hmm. or beautiful, mm -hmm. and that correlates with then with shape mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's it's harder, I guess. You know, it should, it's 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 hard at least to to get the semantics filtered out. But in principle, I think it would be really really exciting. Oh yes. To look at those, and then you can go back to these languages which don't have any you know, or, you know oh, very, you know, much less so mm -hmm. in the system, and see whether you get an inverse correlation. Mm -hmm between what seems to be encoded and the semantics of it and what isn't. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think, I, you know, I mean, we talked about it, I think Bantu languages and the Atlantic languages, non class languages are really exciting for that because the semantics are so different. But, yes. the, but, the, but, the, but the grammar side is actually is quite mm -hmm. similar. So you have the morphological marking, you have the agreement, mm -hmm. you have the non classification system. Um, so it would be really nice to look at that. I yep, I keep repeating myself that I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean that's why I'm here, um, yeah. because I think it would be it would be a very exciting thing to do to have a look at these languages and, yeah, I mean to, as I said, baby steps. I broke out of the Indo-European, so let's jump into you know, <laughs> let's let's take it further and go to you know Bantu, Atlantic, or any of these exciting languages. I couldn't agree more. Any further questions? No. Uh, 
Um, well, if you would like to continue the discussion, please join us uh, at drinks after this at the Institute of Education over there. I will drag Roland there and I'll beer you. for okay. him. So please <laughs> come and join us and um, talk more about the topic and your ideas. So thanks again, Roland. For Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.